To travel by canoe is to ponder where we came from, where we are, where we're going, who we were, who we are, and who we can be. Suspended between the world above and the world below, stillness in harmonic motion, these are the paddle's promises. To paddle is to plug into the energies of the place, the land, the air, the water, the ancestors, the children who are yet to be born. The paddle connects us to all of that. To pull is to connect to the river itself, but also to the lands it nourishes. To be there, to be connected as a mix of Canadians new and old. If it is love that binds people to places in this nation of rivers and in this river of nations, then one enduring expression of that simple truth is surely the canoe. James, I'm recording. Kevin, good to see you. I just have to, I've got my big fire behind, but I wanted to light a fire just for you. This is a brand new beeswax candle from the market. We got last year. Oh, so, yeah. hi, buddy. That is a lovely fire you have behind you. Oh, uh, it's a bit hot for uh, you know, but uh, yeah, thanks. It's um, yep, it's uh, there's nothing like wood heat. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, so what do it, it's a whiskey fireside chat? So you got the fire, yeah. Um, I have for uh, this chat, I have uh. Jira 12 year old, which I didn't know I had. I, I actually had to blow the dust off this. Um, I'm not even sure if it's any good, uh, but I it's, actually, had... it's actually pretty good. I that's yeah. a Highland Park, it's pretty cynical though. It, that one actually has an age on it, doesn't it? Yeah, 12 year old is probably caramel tasting, isn't it? Yeah, mm. well, it's like a breakfast whiskey. It's yeah, well, it's okay. well it is only midday, <laughs> and I, I actually did a devilish thing and put ice with it because i'm not sure about this one yeah i'm running low are you running low well i've actually cracked uh yeah uh, the answer is no but um uh i've, I've actually uh, this is a duty-free bottle of this stuff i can tell you about where it came from but it's it's been around for, for ages i just have it have it for special special occasions uh, cheap whiskey with a good story for special occasions but one of the neat things about living in a small town is that uh, the grocery store and the liquor store never have anybody in them, and um, yeah, and you know, they don't tell. No, no, I won't. I won't tell anybody. But you know, the the uh, the the brands are are, are limited, uh, but the it's got all the bases covered, both in groceries and in liquor. I mean, the essential food groups for your isolatorium. <laughs> It is crazy. I, I just go over the causeway and I found this small store. Um, I won't tell anybody where it is, but they have groceries and uh, alcohol. Slange. And nobody's there. I don't have to line up with the mask on. or I, I just go in there and everything's fine. So it's almost like the public is not happy. I use my buff from Sermalek National Park to pull up over my nose. And, uh, and then, of course, we've got hand sanitizer in the car and hand washing because well because we do i i ran out of hand sanitizer and then I, wait a minute in my emergency uh a kit for my camping i have that because you can light a fire with it so i figure there will be some um some collectibles at the end of this uh covid period one of them would be uh uh, you know, hand sanitizers are made by Hiram Walker or something like that. And the other thing is uh, for those those absolute uh, brand junkies, uh, it'll be Canada Goose uh, scrubs or gowns. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. We'll get something out of it. You'll probably get another book, James. All right. I'm, I'm going to keep to a script this time. Like I really, every single time I, I, I wrote a script for you. Uh, Why is that now, Kevin? You know I'm not going to keep the script. <laughs> All right. The ultimate question I've asked everybody, um, who, what, when, where uh, got you into uh, uh, wilderness canoe tripping? 
Uh, probably uh, Boy Scouts. I did not know you were a scout. Oh, yeah. I'm a Queen Scout, I hate to tell you. Oh, like, like well, shake the left. No, shake, yeah, let's shake the left hand. Yeah, right? Shake with the left hand. Yeah. How do you oh. do? Okay. Well, it was um, uh, 8th Wellington, Knox Church, Guelph, Ontario. And um, we winter camped and summer camped. We had some amazing uh, scout leaders. Carl Mickus was... Uh, was one of the memorable ones, but um, uh, they, I don't, we, we used to have to go and round up canoes. Uh, and I, we, uh, they basically borrowed canoes from people. Um, and, and we would do trips on the Mighty Speed River. And some of them just, you know, we would, or occasionally we'd go to uh, Lake Bellwood, which was a, a dam on the Grand River over by Fergus. Um, and we would paddle there. There was a Boy Scout camp there, one of those nasty open fields with rocks in it that's supposed to be a beautiful campsite, you know. But uh, and then uh, uh, I have vivid, vivid memories of leaving Elf, uh, in a canoe paddling down the mighty Speed River to Hespler and then to Galt and eventually down to uh, to Lake Erie at Dunville and I mean if Holsteins are wild animals then it was definitely wilderness in terms of it being unknown to me and imagined by me as over the horizon it was uh, it was the start of well yeah it was the start of uh, an adventure that continues is that why you you redid the the Grand River a number of years ago? Uh, I remember reading an article in a magazine actually about you um, sort of paddling the whole Grand River. Was that the, the purpose? Yeah, well, I had a, uh, an arrangement or a commission from Canadian Geographic magazine to do a. They wanted a river story of some kind, and I I was going to go north, you know, do a a big river somewhere. But my uh, my aged dad was dying, and I couldn't, I didn't want to leave. And I went to the editor at Canadian Geographic, and I said, "Would would another? I mean, would another river be okay?" And he said, "Well, sure." And so I said, "So what I did is, my dad was uh, he was in critical hospital in London, and then he moved back home, essentially to die in Guelph." Um, but uh, uh, I, I thought, well, if I were with, you know, within a phone calls distance, I could run, run back and forth or run home. And so I did. Uh, it's a while ago. It was called, uh, the piece was called The Old Man and the River. And it was, um, well, you know exactly what it's like. It was, it was, a, it was not sort of the swashbuckling uh, new ground, uh, uh, wildlife at every turn. Although there's a ton of wildlife, urban wildlife, uh, you know, rural wildlife around deer and and porcupines and muskrats and and uh, beavers and raccoons. Um, but um, it had, uh, amazing, um, you know, moments of reflection, just paddling and. And you know how your mind wanders. It was fantastic. You know, I thought a lot about my dad. I thought a lot about uh, being in my home watershed and how this water, uh, you know, it rises off the river and falls as rain. But that that's sort of what was in me. And, and uh, you know, I've traveled literally uh, around the world. But I always am drawn back to that that place, and I miss the smells of the. Uh, I don't miss the shopping carts and old tires in the river, but I I miss the smells of the water. And um, one of the things I learned on that trip, which was so heartening, was the story of the rebirth or the reclaiming of the Grand River, um, wherein uh, local conservation groups. Um, among other things, cleanup initiatives convinced the Grand River Conservation Authority, I think, to make the Bellwood Dam that creates Lake Bellwood, uh, make it a bottom draw instead of a top draw dam. 
yeah. which lowers the temperature of the water coming down the river below the dam, which then with the cleanup initiatives, the, uh, you know, scooping up some of the brown fields along the river and doing all that sort of work, replanting of native species, all that sort of stuff. The brown trout came back and I actually on that trip met a couple of people who, one of them was a fishing guide. I mean, who knew that there are full-time fishing guides on the Grand River in the middle of populated southwestern Ontario. But, uh, oh, it was a super memorable trip. And uh, I still to this day don't know how this happened, but I pulled into Dunville and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a, you know, a, a master card camper when I need to be one. And, and, uh, so I went to a local B and B in Dunville <laughs> and it was my birthday, uh, that day. And, and I, that was no, nobody knew that as far as I knew, asked the B and B person in this big old house in Dunville where to go for dinner. And it was, you know, somebody's diner <laughs> down the road. Went in the diner and had a club sandwich and a bowl of, you know, blue plate rice pudding, which is my favorite. And uh, um, I went to pay the bill and they said, that's okay. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. And I think it might have been the B&B &B people. But uh, anyway, it, you know, trips all have little little stories like that, that all you got to do is look at a picture or just think about it or be poked like by somebody like you, you know, who, who I know is interested in that kind of detail and uh, the memories flood back. Well, it's interesting though, like I know you have Wonderlust. I mean, you've gone everywhere, right? And, and, and still today you're doing amazing things. Like, well, not, not that you should not be doing amazing things today, but, but you still are. But do you find that sometimes a wilderness traveler uh, always likes going back to the familiar? I mean, why do I always go back to Algonquin? I've been to Algonquin ever since I was a kid. Is there a draw for us for that? Or? Uh, probably not enough of a draw. I, you know, as I've, um, as I've kind of been along, I've realized I met people other places in the world, uh, especially places that are populated and kind of kifed up. There's not a lot of wilderness. I realized that Canadians, as a Canadian, as a first generation Canadian, I have become like so many of us totally spoiled where we, you know, we could go at a different place uh, for a lifetime and, and more and never, never, you know, put the campfire in the same place twice, um, which I think is a sort of a false luxury that we, we do that. Um, you know, when I was actually actively teaching, one of the things that I figured out and taught people was that there is great virtue to go back to those places like you to, to Algonquin. And, and, you know, not a lot of people know that um, my wife Gail and I and our kids, we, I mean, we basically raised our kids in, in the north end of Algonquin Park on North Tea Lake at the outflow uh, of the Amable du Fond going down to Manitou in a, a cabin that was graciously sort of brought about to our family by a number of people who, who, uh, who kept it there, an old ranger cabin. But, um, you know, the memories that we have there uh, draw us back again and again and again. And um, you, you see different things, you feel different things, especially when you're, you can kind of let down the guard of the unknown. So, you know, this, that cabin is at a narrows on the Amable du Fond River between North T and Manitou. And it turns out if there's anything moving, especially in the fall uh, on four legs, bears, deer, moose, particularly, they all come right through there. But you know that they're never going to do anything to you. So that's, you don't have to worry about, well, it does give some people, especially our kids, pause for the cause where they have built up the courage to go to the outhouse in the dark and they encounter a black bear. Uh, yeah, I think one of our daughters is still in therapy about that, but we'll just leave that out for now. But what, what that allows you to do though, is to go to different places and, uh, to do different things. And uh, like one of my favorite paddles, I carved at the campfire at that, at that cabin and it was made out of a uh, fallen balsam tree. You know, I always thought maybe you have to. Yeah, yeah, you know, I lose my paddle, I'll carve another one. And I, I'd never done that, but I did that there. And uh, I did it with a crooked knife uh, and, a, and a sweet saw. And 
but you know, I wouldn't have done that if we had, if the place had been new and I was sort of on guard. I kind of let down. I'm blathering. No, you're not. You're not. I, and you'd be surprised during, and, and a lot of people even notice during these interviews, I'm actually quite quiet. Yeah, I was actually, Kevin, I must commend you. Uh, you've been surprisingly quiet. Are you on, like, are you depressed, man? No, like, I'm not on, I'm not on. Any, no, I'm not. I, I mean, maybe did I did. your mother beat you or your dad? <laughs> like, like, the deep stuff you need to talk about, Kevin. My That's mother used to, uh, my mother used to, <laughs> Run around the the kitchen table with a fly swatter, um, very Scottish. Bye, 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 bye. And then we just giggle at her. So yes, uh, no, I actually, uh, I don't know. I actually, to be quite honest, I've got many characters, and um, a lot of people ask me, you know what? I'm not even going to tell, tell stories. Like, this is not my story time. It's your story time. So uh, here, here's another one. Um, outdoor education. So I, I know you uh, taught and you became an outdoor educator uh, at the university. And what made you get into education? Did you want to change the world or? Uh, I don't think I wanted to change the world. Um, I was, uh, why did I get into education? Well, I've been a leader at the YMCA uh, starting when I was just old enough to become a junior leader from 11 or something like that. And of course there's, there's leadership development and scouts and uh but i really 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 wanted to be a marine biologist and i was definitely focused on that i wanted to be uh you know i wanted to learn the skills of a naturalist i wanted to i wanted to understand the national natural world and uh, i kept going down that path until i got into a room at the university of guelph um, with a 750 pound polar bear, uh, teaching it to press paddles to a light stimulus and uh, realized that what I'd wanted to do for my whole life uh, was something that I could not psychically, emotionally f do because I couldn't, I couldn't sit that close to that magnificent animal in the name of science and do what I was doing. Um, and feels any way fulfilled by it. So um, that was a kind of a epic corner in, <laughs> in my life. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I thought, well, what am I gonna do now? I, you know, I had, a, I had a honors BSc in biology and I was, you know, I was gonna do this bear work for a master's and presumably go on after that but uh i couldn't i didn't have the stomach for the work and i was i was embarrassed i was you know i basically failed at doing that and uh so what do you do then and uh, so off i went to uh, to teachers college but all along the way through scouts and eventually through uh, uh work at kirk whipper's camp camp candelor uh, i knew that uh, a i loved being outside and B, I loved um, teaching people, you know, stuff, how to use an ax, how to canoe, because it gave you the skills, you know, a lot like you, where, you know, the skills to get out there and learn all of the things that you learn when you're, when you're a bit beyond the, the edge of what's comfortable. And um, so I actually did that, you know, I taught high school for, what, three years, and then eventually, so strangely became uh, a faculty member at Queen's University Faculty of Outdoor Edu uh, uh, Faculty of Education and eventually ran the outdoor and exper ex uh, exper I can't even say it. I did I uh, worked as the uh, the head of that uh, outdoor and experiential education unit at the Faculty of Ed for 20, 20 years and uh, I'd still be there. Uh, I came to a kind of an ethical cul-de-sac um, and uh, and resigned. Uh, June 19th, 1999, and uh, I've kind of been making it up as I go along, but um, I still see myself fundamentally as, a, as an outdoor educator, if you like. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I, and um, going back to the, uh, the university, I, um, I, you know, you and I talked a lot, but I don't really know why you left and that we don't really know, need to know that. But what you said to me was really, really critical in my, my career. I was working um, 
at the college part time still, and I, I was you know had some ethical issues going on there. And I remember seeing you, and you said, "Well, um, maybe it's a." Good, and I had a really good group of students, uh, and there were students at risk, whatever. But they were really good, solid. I mean, whatever. And you said, "Well, maybe it's a good time to leave then. Uh, leave when it's positive, not negative." And um, when you left the university and then went started working um, with or helping out at the museum, was that a really positive change in your life? Um, yeah, I suppose it was. I mean, um, it's funny. I, the change has never had a valence. It's never had a positive or a minus. I mean, a lot of cool things happened. I didn't go immediately to help out at the museum, but, um, you know, I started writing, uh, you know, full time. I was doing writing for ORCA, the Ontario Recreational Canoeing Association and their standards and that sort of stuff. But, um, uh, I have seen in retrospect, that um, uh, leaving the the university um, provided opportunities that, that I would never, never have had. And some of the crazy shit that has gone down, wonderful crazy stuff, like hanging around for 32 nights in a Polynesian sailing canoe this time last year in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or going to Antarctica or, or making movies or... The crack of glacial ice entering consciousness, the breath of a passing whale, the thrum of my own beating heart. I come here for the silence. Silence begets reverence. Uh, I don't know, just learning from, from different people along the way. None of that would have, would have happened without the university. But I will say... Um, the hunger that I really miss teaching. I really miss teaching. And those Thursday and Friday afternoons when you might not have classes to teach, but you'd have graduate students or just really interested students who'd be reading something you hadn't read and in they'd come and they'd want to talk about it. Or they, um, uh, yeah, and just just that, that sense of, uh, of teaching as performance, I miss that. So, uh, now, you know, when I'm sort of, um, I don't know what, an independent scholar, creatively unemployed, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, I, I seek out those opportunities. And, you know, latterly, I mean, since I left Queens uh, and, and before my work with Students on Ice, you know, I'm a, basically a frontline outdoor educator and I do a ton of stuff now. I do music. I did um, workshops last summer at the mouth of the Croker Glacier and we we got kids from 22 countries and wrote a script for a film that opened the uh, New York Climate Conference last uh, last September it's a film called Two Breaths and uh, that kind of work um, just uh, just just feeds me uh, like like nothing else JF JF this is Ian over yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I want to be a Zodiac driver. Don't put me on the ship, don't put me on the shore, don't put me on the beach, I've been there before. Don't put me on the hike, either short or long. Just put me in a rubber boat, cause I want to be a Zodiac driver. Zodiac driver! So that was solid advice that you gave me that day, but you're probably giving it to yourself. You're actually saying like, it's time to move on and, and progress as opposed to get stagnant. The, um, the, your first book, was it uh, Summer North of 60? It wasn't, was it? Well, it depends what you count. My first book with my name on it was the Canoe Ontario uh, Safety Resource Manual, which I edited and, and wrote great chunks of. But the first trade book was uh, uh, Wild Waters. Oh yeah, with uh, a book right there. <laughs> with, um, Harp, uh, no, Key Porter books. Yeah, wow, that was a while back. Wow. And then uh, the uh, that led to my then publisher and still friend and publisher, although we're three companies down the line. Phyllis Bruce, she said, you know, we'd we'd like to do another book. Is there, uh, we'd like to do a book with journey in it somehow and some canoe. And is there anything that any journey that is more important than any of the others? And at that time, um, 
the the journey that was most important was the first date I had with my first wife, Gail, uh, my only wife, Gail. Um, Low these forty years later, uh, where we paddled uh, from Mun Lake in the uh, Lockhart River system to uh, to Bathurst Inlet, um, and that first date became summer north of sixty. That's fantastic. Do you remember years ago at the the uh, canoe symposium we had here in Peterborough a long time ago? I introduced you. I was, was remembering that. Worst, that was the worst intro I've ever given in my life. It was hilarious though. I. All I said, well, I don't know if, do you remember that moment? I do, but Kevin, probably not like you do. So let her rip, buddy. Okay, I remember. Uh, the second time. I, you know, again, very hyper young person. I admired your book. I loved your book. And I didn't really know you that well, but I just thought it was a cool, this is a really good book. And all I, 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 you know, I was supposed to say all these, I had it listed, all these great things you had accomplished and all the, you know, who you are. I just stood up and stage. Yeah, I read his book at the laundromat, and this woman was holding her lingerie in front of me and tried to try to hook me up with her, and I could care less because I wanted to finish your book. <laughs> That's how good of a writer you are, James. Well, thanks very much, I think. All right. Um, your favorite book? that you've written, you've written a lot of books. And that, that's probably a really bad question because what's your favorite canoe trip? What's your favorite river? But what was the one book that you really dove into or even after the fact, you're really glad you wrote? Um, it's, a, it's a weird question, Kevin. Yeah, it is a weird question. I don't like that question myself, but. I mean, Bill, Bill Mason's answer to what's your favorite trip, it was always the last one he was on. And, and I will say that the book that is, filling me now uh, is the book um, that is finally an, uh, an honoring of the bear I walked away from in the mid 70s at the University of Guelph, um, which is a new book and we can talk about that or not, but it's coming out this fall actually. It just had a sort of publicity launch the other day and uh, um, it's, it's near and dear to my heart. But um, no, I uh, I write about the relationship between people and place, um, you know, and I write for TV, I write for radio, I write, you know, magazines and that sort of thing. And uh, the one thing that keeps me going when I press the return button is that I hope I'll do it better next time. And I look forward to, uh, I love the, uh, the editorial collaborative process. And uh, I know that the drivel that comes out of my typewriter or computer is always enhanced, almost always enhanced by by, uh, by the eyes and sensibilities of uh, other people. And, uh, you know, I was the world's worst English student. Um, uh, but I've learned since that uh, education kills by degrees and you can learn stuff other ways. And uh, I love writing. I, I write a lot. I write every day. Um, just like I love paddling and I try to paddle every day, but um, writing is a discipline uh, that I love for many reasons. And I suspect, you know, there's some overlap here with you, but one of the things I like about moving forward toward the horizon, and it doesn't matter whether it's with a typewriter or a canoe, is that there is, um, there's risk. There's the possibility that the whole thing could fail. I love that. I really do. I, I and, and I mean, eventually I ended up, you know, with a PhD essentially in cultural anthropology. And one of the neat things about that is that no, nobody can teach you to be an anthropologist or nobody can teach you to be a writer. And I love that about, uh, you know, investigating the lives and the sensibilities of people. And that's what I sort of do in my writing. But really the idea that this could all go horribly wrong, um, both keeps you up at night, but also gives you that incredible sense of satisfaction. Like right now, just outside of the frame in this lovely little room, um, is a stack of paper with the first pages. First time I've seen a book I've been working on for four years, this book about the bears. Um, it's in pages. And Kevin, you, you would know what that feels like, um, you know, to, to know that that's going out there and, and uh, it could it could bomb, but um, 
man, it's exciting. Yeah, the blues, when you get the blues back, right? They, uh, the, the one moment, too, uh, it was years ago. I'm not sure what book you were working on, but it was a really cool moment when uh, I asked you how the book was going. Um, and you probably will remember what book it was. But basically, I said, how's it going? Well, you know, um, I was really busy with everything, uh, and I have to get this done, like, in two months. But it's, it, it's up here, so everything's fine. It will all happen. And I, I'm not sure what book that was. It was a, a quite a few years ago. Um, and I think you actually were walking on the beach uh, uh, in the East Coast uh, when you had this epiphany. Well, just calm down. You, you have it in your brain. You'll write it down because it's already written, but you haven't put it on paper yet. So this last book that you've, you've done, and, and we just heard about it this week, uh, The Bear. Was that in your head for a long time? Was it floating around for a long time as you just spit it out and put it on paper? I, I think the, sh the short answer is, yeah, probably. Um, but when I set down my lab coat and Dirty Harry pistol and all the things that you needed to do the bear research and walked away from there, I, I felt a debt to that bear. Um, needed to come back to but uh, I mean this book called Walking Ice is is really different from anything it's still creative nonfiction but it's really different from anything I've ever written before and it, it it's meant to be a portrait of humanity in 30 months in the life of a female polar bear in southwestern <laughs> Hudson Bay and you think you go whoa what's that um, it was inspired by by Huxley, the bear at university, but it was also inspired by something, something of an epiphany that's happened over the last, I don't know, five or six years. Um, when you do what I do, which is, you know, write for a living, essentially, you've got to write a lot of different stuff and different people pay. And I've ended up working with some very creative uh, documentary filmmakers writing scripts. And one of the things I've realized is that there, when documentary film writing or work is done right, the filmmakers are not aiming at your head. I think they're aiming at your heart. And uh, two things grew out of that. One of them was, what would a book, what would a book look like if it were written to be aimed at somebody's heart? And the second thing that came out of that was why on earth would you want to do that? And the epiphany that has come from the work with filmmakers, and maybe you've had the same thing, is that, um, you know, I've always written what I thought were sort of rational arguments, call them arguments, but rational sort of uh, developments of ideas to get people to care for the earth. But I'm not sure I've changed anybody's behavior. I may have helped people understand something in a new way. But if you wanted to write a book to change somebody's behavior, we don't act on what we know, we act on what we feel. And I thought, gee whiz, um, well, the last line of my two books ago called Circling the Midnight Sun was, we are the bear, referring to uh, that contentious 28 seconds of animation and St. Alan of Gore's amazing movie, An Inconvenient Truth, you know, the bears swimming around and looking for a place to call home. Well, I think that's us. I think that we're swimming around in a warming soup of our own making, looking for a place to call home. And as such, in Circling the Midnight Sun, I said, we are the bear. And I, I wanted to come back to that. But the way I came back to it was writing a story, story that is so simple and so stripped down, it took me four years to write it. <laughs> And that's called Walking Ice, and um, uh, it's landing in the middle of Covidia here, and um, uh, I'm really hoping it'll get out there somehow in the, uh, in the firestorm that is keeping bookstores closed. Yeah, Margaret, I would uh, send uh, a note out um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure if you got the whole thing. Basically, she was trying to inspire us, saying, well, yeah, it, it's hell, because of you, you were on tour, and I was on tour, and it got canceled. Um, and I'm glad that you're right now not on tour. I mean, it was going to happen soon with this new book, but uh, she said that's terrible. But at the same time, the best um, work that comes out of a, an author is when you're uh, in a pandemic. Well, 
uh, she's she's probably got a got a point, and uh, I would never use any method known to Margaret Atwood because I think uh, she's a real writer, and I'm not entirely sure what I am, but it sure as hell is not in that category. But I tell you what I've been doing is I've been walking uh, the dogs a lot, and that's where I do most of my writing. And uh, I must say that uh, in terms of uh, peace in my heart, uh, there's probably more of it now uh having been in social isolation uh, for six weeks uh or whatever it is then there is in the normal crazy life i mean that what got well yes same thing happened to you i, I imagine my little computer as an etch-a-sketch and you know on whatever day it was <laughs> this dates me i guess but you know etch-a-sketch you make all this elaborate pattern on it you know the dates in your calendar and all these gigs and <laughs> nothing gone and the opportunity then is to be able to you know i paddle and i walk and um, think about stuff that i haven't thought about for a long time yeah i i i'm finding now with isolation a, a lot of people are worried about me because i'm using the bush by now or i'm on the road um, in fact right now i'm using on the road a lot and I'm actually feeling calm. Like I, it's not a calm time to be, I'm not saying that, but I'm okay because as a writer, I'm used to being in solace, right? Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. The, uh, oh my Lord, okay, look, look, I've only asked you one question out of my script for the love of God, man. Um, all right, are you still active with the Canoe Museum? Oh no, no, more, no, look, before that, you're, you want, you're gonna write a bio on Craig McDonald? I am. Hey, uh, I gotta, oh. in, the, in the very early stages, uh, I don't know if people know Craig McDonald, but um, yes, uh, Craig McDonald is one of the most uh, amazingly driven and smart and committed and passionate people uh, in the wilderness, well, in the any world that I know. I met Craig McDonald when I was five. Um, he led a cookout in the rain at Camp Gandalore and seemed impervious to the whining of little boys and to the rain. And I have been traveling with him, learning from him. But he, uh, he's in his, what would he be, 46? I guess he's in his early 70s now. But uh, this is a man who, in the course of his lifetime, made a, an amazing map uh, essentially of Northern Ontario from the Quebec edge of the Quebec border to the Manitoba border. But what he did to create that map, which is all of the original shorelines, all of the original portages, all of the original winter routes, he interviewed 500 people, indigenous elders, woodsmen, timber cruisers, uh, land managers, and, uh, he became reasonably fluent in Anishinaabe, in Cree, and um, you would know the name. Um, Ms. Dogwin? Well, uh, I was thinking of uh, the bark and skin boats of North America, Edwin Tappan Adney, and yeah. uh, what's his name, La Chapelle. Adney and Chappelle is the, is the Bible, if you like, of birch bark canoes. Edwin Tapp and Adney collected the canoes and documented them exhaustively, and La Chapelle helped him write what became the Bible of bark canoes. Craig McDonald holds in <laughs> about 4,000 lineal feet of piles of full scap with pencil, drawings, notes of the winter equivalent of that. Toboggans, trails, um, stanchion sleds, winter techniques, winter camping, hot camping, stoves, all of those things. Craig has all of that detail. And um, as I say, we're just in the early stages, but uh, Victoria and Dick uh, Richard Grant uh, from Tomogamy, Victoria's from uh, Bear Island, and well, they both live up there. Dick's a lawyer, uh, but the, the Tomogamy uh, Community Foundation uh, really would like to get Craig's story out there, and um, they've asked me if I would 
give a hand. And uh, I just, I mean, these things just don't come along every day. And yeah, it's probably going to take a good couple of years. But uh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I feel seriously privileged to um, to be even broaching this this topic. To, I mean, it's sacred ground. And um, Craig is a good friend. And um, uh, and strangely, you know, having walked the path I walked, I have a bag of skills that that uh, will come to bear on that that project, and uh, hopefully will result in a a story that uh, that's out there that nobody really knows. Is that similar to the her pulls? Uh, like you didn't know her pull, but you actually uh, wrote his well his trips up. Um, even though it, it sounds similar, but was it a different process? Because you weren't, well, you knew him, but you weren't friends and colleagues, whatever. And, but you decided to put all his, his stuff together. Why did you do that? It's just a crazy story. Yeah, I knew her Paul only in going to the Wilderness Canoe Symposium. I saw him here and there. We corresponded about roots. I did a project for National Geographic in Nunavik and, and Northern Quebec and oh, he was really interested in that route and he was down here with the maps and wanting all the details because I'd interviewed Daniel Pettigumscum and some of the people from Arthur Toomey's uh, Needle of the uh, needle to the North. Anyway, the phone rang one day. Um, wait, I heard that Herb had died and Herb died at the mouth of the, he was found at the mouth of the Michpokotan River drowned um, and there was some kind of uh, weather event that had gone through but he was so seasoned uh, yeah anyway I'd heard that he died I was in the Arctic in the summer and the phone rang this day and it was Rob Butler who was Herb's best friend and it was it was quite different than the story I described of Craig but he uh, Rob just said look um, her Herb um, left on his desk a rough manuscript for his life story called The Lure of Faraway Places, and we don't know what to do with it. Would you help us uh, turn it into a book? And uh, what do you say? You can't really say no. <laughs> um, and um, so I shuffled on down to Burlington, where he lived with his wife, Mora, in a two-bedroom ground floor apartment. Uh, not far from the lake where he kept his canoe in the living room um, and uh, entered his life that way. And my principal job as a writer and editor in that project was to stay the hell out of, of him. Guy was amazing. He wrote in his second language, at least his second language. He was Austrian to begin with. He learned to speak English from a guy called Frenchy in the gold mines in Rouen, Miranda. And, uh, he produced this book and my over the phone when Rob, when Rob said, you know, would you help with this? I thought, well, sure, you know, you'll clean it up and run on down to Kinko's or Staples and, you know, run a few copies off and the family, I have them. I got into this thing and it was beautiful and it was incredible, you know, solo traveler. He was probably, probably one of the, I don't know, top, three solo travelers anywhere in this continent. He'd been more places, he'd done more stuff. And um, what was amazing about the manuscript, and Kevin, you would, you would singularly understand this, I bet. He would be in some absolute hellhole on the border between Labrador and Quebec. Have no freaking clue where he was on the map you know, plus or minus, yes. Um, he'd be up to his waist in black muck and be set with bugs and he'd be hungry. In one case, his fire jumped to the front of his FEMAT canoe and started it on fire. But what does he do in the middle of all that? He identifies a point of prospect on the map, like a little high point. And he bush, you know, he'd, he'd get to camp soaking wet. He'd bushwhack to the top of this thing just to see what he, <laughs> he could see. And he wasn't a florid 
writer by any means, but his turn of phrase, you know, his understatement, he'd get up there and, you know, he'd tell you what he saw. And, and uh, I was absolutely captivated by it. And that's when I went to, uh, went to Dundurn and uh, at the time, Barry Penhill and Jane Gibson had just, just taken Natural Heritage books to Dundurn. Um, actually, I think I may have gone to them before they went there, but anyway, um, those details fade, but um, it was a book and uh, it's a book that stands there, you know, the lure of faraway places. It's her, her Paul's life story. I don't think Craig's, I think there'll be, uh, I think the challenge would be the same for me to keep James Raffin out of the, uh, out of Craig's story, but there's very much a writerly task here in, in carving, a, you know, finding a narrative arc in notes of, on 500 interviews. I mean, you can't just detail 500 interviews. And in I mean, it, but it's an amazing life. The tentative title for this is Mr. McDonald's Map. <laughs> <laughs> would it be different? Um, it, this is just off the cuff. Would it be different because Herb had passed away, but Craig is not. So um, would that make a difference when you're writing a book like that? Um, yeah, I, I've written about live people and dead people. And um, you need to, you know, when I said it's sacred ground, um, it's it's sacred ground, and you you need to move very, very carefully uh, as a writer, and and you know that. Um, is it different? Maybe. Uh, you know, take a guy like Kirk Whipper. You know, I've tried to sell his biography um, to a number of different publishers. I tried to do it while he was alive, and I have tried a little bit after his death, and um, I have not had a lot of success with that, but uh, um, that's a story that I think can only be fully told um, in the fullness of time long after somebody has departed. You know, you take somebody like George Simpson, uh, whose biography I published called Emperor of the North. He was, you know, dead for at least 100 years, maybe a little longer. And uh, there were stories that could be told then. Um, but um, I think the challenge of um, sculpting her pole's passion into a coherent um, book with a beginning, middle, and an end is in some ways similar to um, shaping a portrait of Craig McDonald's uh, passion. Um, um, but um, so I have no interest in salacious detail. Um, but on the other hand, if, uh, you know, something is um, near to the wind, it's a time to consult, especially, I mean, in Craig's case, he, he talked to a lot of people and you know, there'll be family sensibilities about who's talking to whom and whose story can be told and who owns this and all that sort of stuff. So uh, that is still pretty fresh um, and, and uh, will, be, um, will be important to recognize uh, in the creation of, uh, of Craig's, Craig's story. And also having Craig there to say, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and then also having the courage to say, well, Craig, um, I don't think it is bullshit. I think this is you, and maybe you don't see it. And that's part of the give and take, part of the uh, part of the, the writing creation process that I uh, I absolutely love. Well, it's true because you weathered the storm. You you've been doing this for a long time. So, and I know Craig. I don't know as well as you do, but it would be hilarious to be a fly on the wall when he t told you that's bullshit, and you saying, "Well, actually, is it? Is it not?" And you as a creator and a writer, that's your job, right? Um, and I think that's fantastic. That's well, I I mean, not on the script whatsoever. What the? <laughs> All right, and um, by the way, uh, Jira, yeah, whatever. Uh, oh, okay. Three more questions. Well, two questions and then a conclusion. Uh, you're somewhat involved in the Canoe Museum still. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll do that some other time with the Canoe Museum, but uh, the whole move thing, they're about to move, and it was all exciting, and it is still exciting, but the whole pandemic happened. So what, what's going on now? 
uh, to use their involved. The Canoe Museum has been my life's passion. I will make no excuse for that. I went to Kirk Whipper's camp as a five-year-old. I left and I don't know how old I was, but I should have gone probably earlier. I believe in the project. I've been involved with the project as a volunteer. I paddled these canoes as a kid and uh, I've been a sometimes staffer since 2007. I was executive director for seven years and now I'm, I've got a long fancy title. Uh, which is the director of external relations, I believe it is. Um, uh, but uh, I'm very proud to be associated and to uh, wear their their mark and to uh, to be there. Canada is a nation of rivers, and that fact of our geography makes Canada a nation of canoes in the full extent of the country. If there was a need to travel or communicate that was felt by a group of people, doesn't matter what linguistic group, if they turned to natural materials to meet that need, a canoe resulted. A canoe is unique in that it can be picked up and carried around obstacles, whether those obstacles are cities or waterfalls or whatever they are. Most of the transportation routes and patterns that have been echoed and reiterated by other means, highways and, and other and railways and um, are really routes that were established by the canoe. And that's part of the magic that still surrounds the canoe now. It's an exciting time. And um, the one thing that, uh, I mean, I just got off a almost daily call. Um, Carolyn Heslop, our executive director, bless her, has had to lay off 80% of the staff uh, because of revenues decaying oh. the way they did. And, um, um, but we still, uh, we still meet um, weekly and we still are carrying uh, a variety of projects. Most importantly, the dual agenda of reinventing the museum and relocating the museum. And sadly, um, before COVID struck, we were set for a, an April board meeting. We just had our AGM by Zoom. Uh, there was going to be a go, no go meeting. I mean, this has all been sculpted by our chair and board and finance uh, committee and fundraising cabinet, but we were gonna put a shovel in the ground this fall and we were gonna have a new museum in 2023 and we've worked like crazy. And, you know, I remember 10 years ago when I was executive director, we, uh, you've been in the boardroom, you know, there's this nasty little whiteboard from Staples at the end. And um, on one side of the whiteboard, it had uh, uh, in, in, you know, in dry mark, it said 910 Monaghan. And on, on the other side, it said water. And between there and there, there were all these sticky notes of all the things we needed to do. And I remember somebody in that meeting saying, Ooh, you know, this, this could cost as much as $10 million. And we all went, Oh, yeah, that's a lot of money. Well, yeah, well, turns out it's not 10, it's 65 million. And who knew? We were about three quarters, we are about three quarters of the way there. We've had more people come out of the woodwork. We were just about to get ready for our public part of our campaign. And, um, it's very exciting. It's exciting for Peterborough. It's exciting for Peterborough County. It's exciting for Ontario. And it's, it's, it's exciting for Canada. It's exciting for the world. And uh, uh, COVID has landed in the middle of that, which, uh, you know, you've, you've been close enough to the museum to know that it never seems to do anything like any other normal organization. I mean, if, if there's a way from A to B, it sure as hell is not a straight line. And, and uh, COVID seems somehow just par for the course. But um, Carolyn is working with the uh, chair. We've just moved over uh, to a new chair at the, at the AJM two days ago, but uh, with the fundraising cabinet and uh, we're focused intently on uh, communicating with our donors, communicating with our government partners, with all of our partners to make sure that we can we obviously can't put a shovel in the ground in the fall, um, but um, to keep keep the project going because it's so exciting. And uh, so my job now is, uh, and I'm delighted, Kevin, that you've agreed to come on to the National Council. One of my jobs is, uh, besides kind of telling the story and uh, 
carrying the flag to the places I go um, uh, is to build the National Council um, because we're thinking of the museum no longer as a glass case into which you put beautiful things from the hinterland and you love the shit out of them with your white gloves on and all that stuff. We're thinking, although that's important, you know, looking after the collection. And that was the principal uh, compulsion to move was to put the, you know, these, the wood and the bark and the skin and the cedar and all that stuff, put it in a, a condition uh, called category A. It doesn't really matter what it's called, but it, the, the temperature and uh, humidity conditions that will give it the, the best possible long-term life. Um, uh, uh, but rather thinking of the museum as the hub of an interconnected network of people, organizations, communities, um, institutions, First Nations, who know and love the canoe in a contemporary context. And uh, the National Council, which is now numbering about uh, 80, 80 people, is one of the initiatives to do that. We're walking canoes back to uh, the original thing. So in answer to your question, the Canoe Museum, like everybody else, is uh, scratching its collective head going, what do we do now? But we are looking at pushing content out um, to keep our audiences engaged, to keep our volunteers engaged, to keep our members engaged, to keep the stories flowing. And uh, my job as a storyteller will be written into that, doing what you're doing. I mean, I've been doing that on my own with different organizations and Zoom and doing what we do. But the museum has a tremendous amount of incredible content. Museums are great for, for a local community. They bring people together, they, they attract tourists, they create jobs, and they help keep our cities, our communities, more vibrant places to call home. The decision to move this collection to the water's edge um, was a courageous dream uh, that the board and the team at the Canoe Museum had. And you get your courage knowing that your community's got your back. So the community that's uh, wrapped around the Canoe Museum from coast to coast to coast, thank you. The story of how we've gotten here is a success story that I hope we all continue to tell and retell because this is how big dreams come to life. Plus, we're continuing to look after the collection and da 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 da. But uh, the answer is, uh, all things considered, the museum's heart is beating. It's beating strongly, and uh, it is uh, it is a project to keep your eye on because um, as soon as the earth starts to turn again, we're going to be one of those proverbial shovel-ready projects that. Minister Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, and everybody's going to be looking for to rekindle human belief in uh, what we can do and, and to rally the troops, as it were. We were so close to, you know, we, we didn't put out a tender for, for a, um, a construction company, which was going to go out this month. And I'm, I'm glad we didn't do that because that might have led to some contractual issues uh, with COVID, but um, we're, we're ready. We've still got a ways to go uh, financially. So if you've got any, you know, spare cash kicking around the house there. <laughs> Have you yeah. seen my place? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a little, little story about the Canoe Museum. That's fantastic. That, well, so uh, again, progression, change, uh, and it's all going to happen. And I think you know, I, I know the people in the museum and they're phenomenal people and the volunteers and the, and the people that work there and we'll get all over this and it's to do with the passion, right? Uh, you just have to walk in and, and I mean, for me, yeah, it, it is a whole bunch of old canoes that actually show history, but to me, it, it's just uh, our our culture, our, our uh, canoe culture. I think that, that the whole museum represents that and it will all happen. I think we're all going to get through this in a better sense than if we didn't go through it even though right now we don't want to go through it well i think we're figuring some stuff out about what's important and um and you know the the canoe museum uh is important and uh it it, it carries an amazing story about what canada is where it came from what it is but also where it could go and some of the work that uh, in um, 
collaborative relations that the museum is doing um, is just it's groundbreaking, it's important, it's messy, it's wonderful. And I think it, it uh, I think the museum has a leadership force and has been to some extent. Uh, we just need to, to let more people know what it is and what we're doing. And I mean, we just com completed a fairly exhaustive survey process of people uh, close in and further out. And uh, one of the, you know, consistent messages coming back um, is uh, we need to know more. We need to know what you're doing. And we're going to be doing our best to push out details about that as we go. And yeah, I would love to do another another museum focused discussion at some point. All right. Uh, so museums, uh, they're, they're not past, they're past, present and future, right? So I, I was going to end tonight basically with uh, a reading, you doing reading, and there's a whole bunch of great stuff that I've read about, about uh, I, I mean, the great story is basically, my God, that freaking drill is strong, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Do you, need, do you need CPR, Kevin? No, I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Um, do you need the Heimlich maneuver? Oh, wait, you can't oh. call it that anymore. Do you okay. need a thrust thrust, Kevin? Really? I, when did that happen? Yeah. I mean, for my sins, I have all my sailor's papers and I have to do advanced first aid every two years and I just finished mine. You can't call it the Heimlich maneuver anymore. Well, that's good because I've never understood that. Uh, I was going to ask you to do a reading about when you were naked, you lost your canoe adrift and you had to dive into really cold water to save it uh, out of the book Tumble Home, which is great. Uh, however, uh, I think you've made some really good points. The whole museum idea is also present and future. So I don't know what you have in front of you, but could you uh, read something from your bear book? Well, I could, but I decided it would be uh, it would be premature to do that. But this, I, what I want to read to you is uh, you, your original impulse was to ask me to read something about being naked and and feeling stupid. Um, and I think I'd like to read that, and it does relate to this. I mean, you asked why I left Queens, and I don't particularly want to bore people with the details of that, except to say that it was a uh, it was a decision that I took uh, for ethical reasons, and uh, uh, it left me in an interesting place. Having said, uh, see you later to a you know the entrepreneurial freedom of an independent, but the uh, stability and security of a civil servant and um, a big fat salary and all that sort of stuff and to say no to that um, what do you do when you when you walk away as I did on the 19th of June 1999 well you um, you go on a canoe trip and uh, you try to figure out what's going on and that's where this story uh, that's where this story picks up so I'll this is from my book um, Tumble Home by the way, of all the letters I have gotten about the stuff that I've written, and I love to get them, I'm sure you do too. I got a letter written on the 10th of September, 2011, from a woman in New York City who said, Dear James, uh, I moved on the 9th of September to an apartment on the X floor of a high-rise apartment building in New York City. and." Uh, on the 10th of September, or the 11th of September, uh, I was in my apartment and I watched the planes fly into the World Trade Center. And she said, I, I didn't know what to do. It's a bit like my wife Gail and me today and these days since the tragedy in Nova Scotia, but the, the New York tragedy was so much, so much greater, but not to the individual families. Anyway, she said, um, I was surrounded by boxes. I hadn't unpacked anything. Somebody had given me a copy of your book, Tumble Home, and I sat on the boxes as the smoke was coming out of the ruins of those buildings, and I read your book, and it was affirming, and it did all these things, and uh, I have the letter. It's right in this. This is my reader's copy of it. Oh, it's, um, anyway, one of the stories, this is the story right at the, uh, at the end of that. Uh, so I, I quit my job, having worked 20 years in a relatively respectful, respectable 
establishment and tossed it all to the wind. And here's where the story picks up. You ready? I'm ready. Cheers. Pour a drink. Cheers. A year later, I'm on a solo canoe trip back in the Northwest Territories. I'm unsure why exactly I'm here. Out here on the water, not regretting the decision to resign for an instant, I understand that the courage, if that's what it took, to give up a meaningful remunerative job came from my years on the river. Maybe I've come here to say thank you. Resigning was the right thing to do. Or maybe the river has a few supplementary lessons in mind. Day one, a paddle shaft splinters in the middle of a critical maneuver right at the top of a rapid. With the spare paddle tied out of reach in the bow, I must flail with the splintered wood and do the best possible under the circumstances. The canoe ends up backwards at the bottom of the rapid, but we, the canoe and me, manage to uphold the first rule of canoeing, which you know, Kevin, always keep the open side up. Day three. A big black bear wanders into camp, for, uh, forcing a, a quick move down the river. Day four, a crisis blossoms out of nowhere in mid-afternoon. I'd spent the morning being careful not to upset in rapids, to snap any more paddles, or to meet any more bears, but the river widened into a small lake, and I spied a small overgrown cabin. Stopping to investigate, Seems like a harmless diversion on an otherwise calm day. The cabin's door has been torn off, but the building isn't very old. It's a stacked log affair, about 20 by 30 feet. And as the graffiti on the wall testifies, its last occupants were cutting line for a survey. Right bush they were by the look of the crazy writing on the table, the empty liquor boxes, a well-thumbed calendar, and a filthy t-shirt nailed to the wall as if on display. I will add that it had a package of cool cigarettes empty in the pocket of the t-shirt. That's not in the book. As I amble back to the canoe for lunch, thinking about Earl Burney's experience cutting trails for the survey, as described in his poem, David, all is right with the world. But the reverie snaps when I arrive back at the water to find the canoe floating, fully loaded, about 50 feet from shore. A zephyr has come up and blown the canoe off the sloping rock where it was parked. There is nothing to do but strip and dive in after it. Even though I'm swimming furiously, the canoe gets closer but never within reach. Twice I get to within 20 feet of the boat and twice it gets away. It's as if someone with a string is teasing me, pulling the canoe slowly to let me catch up and then whisking it back out of reach. Floundering into a bed of weeds in the middle of the lake, I slow down, and it dawns on me that they find dead people in weed beds in the middle of lakes. Then an overhead picture of what is happening flashes to mind. A canoeist, stark naked, exhausted, in the middle of a chilly lake north of Yellowknife, in a weed bed, trying to swim for an uncatchable canoe. Scary. Stupid. Not a dream. Another flurry of strokes results in nothing more than an inhaled mouth of water, but I'm still several hundred yards from shore and no closer to the canoe. I can see the grain of the paddle shaft sticking up behind the seat. A red and white painter, floatable rope for safety, hangs limply over the stern deck, alone. I filed a trip plan with my wife and a friend in Yellowknife, but they will only know that something is wrong if I fail to show up at the end of the trip in the middle of next week. The water's brisk. My personal flotation device is where it should be, in the canoe. <laughs> on, its way, on its way to a marsh on the far side of the lake. I had a light breakfast and nothing for lunch. I've swung my, uh, swung myself to exhaustion. My muscles are now perfused with adrenaline and cramping with lactic acid. And now the canoe is a dot on the water and my clothes are a tiny heap on the shore several hundred yards back. For more than a moment, I think this is it. I remember a story told to me in Lutzelke by a Métis man who had gone through the ice on his snow machine. His friend had drifted into the depths in his snowmobile suit and died. Underwater, he said, he called his friend's name. 
He told me of slipping down and seeing his own white toque tumbling in front of his face in the blue-green water. It was only then that he saw his own hat that he realized he too would die if he didn't take hold of the situation and kick his way back to the surface. I roll onto my back and switch to the elementary backstroke, which swimming instructors always said is a useful stroke for a tired swimmer. I consciously slow down my pace, deepening my breathing, and try to relax and uncoil the panic constricting in my throat. Survival, they say, is about discipline, mental discipline and focus. That's how the Métis man saved himself. I concentrate on lengthening the glide and making the kick as efficient as possible, as if I'm being tested on style and proper. <laughs> For a time, a point on the other side of the lake looks as if it isn't getting any closer, but by degrees it looms and gradually the problem of drowning is replaced by the prospect of moving along the opposite shore to retrieve the canoe. Somewhere in the middle of that transition, while still well out from shore, I become conscious of how the heat of exertion radiating from my whole body is being swept away by rivulets of cool water as I move through the lake. And it occurs to me that the drifting canoe is simply the next in a series of tests, as if this trip is some kind of portal between careers. At shore, however, the game goes on. The canoe is still visible, blowing against a horsetail marsh at the end of the lake, about a kilometer away. The lake bottom, I discover, is mostly sand with occasional weeds. So I'm able to porpoise through the shadow, shallows, but then the water deepens and the bottom gets mucky, forcing me among the sedges close to land. Here the bottom is uneven, the going slow. I step into a hole, a tri-cornered sedge knifes up between my legs. Ouch. Now with the blood dripping from a nasty nick in my personage, I continue along the shore just in time to see the canoe disappear in the wind swaying horsetail. By the time I reach a point on the shore where I think the canoe might be, it disappears again, forcing me to climb the sloping bank of the lake to try to find it among the reeds. Fortunately, the paddle I, that I had casually stood between the bow seat and the packs is just visible, and I head out into the marsh to go the last distance. I do my best to wallow through chest-deep ooze, too soft to sand in and too thick to swim through. Parting plants that are over my head, I move in the general direction of the canoe. Again, it disappears. And again, I must regroup, waiting for the wind to move the reeds enough to find the boat again. Once more, the tip of the paddle appears, and I jubilantly grasp the canoe's gunwale, staring lovingly at the scratched white fiberglass side of the canoe, where it curves back to the center tumble home. Rain begins as I heft myself in out of the muck, smelling like a rose. Later, reclothed and dry, I sit at the pock table in the cabin, sipping hot coffee and eating lunch. Three realizations strike me right away about what happened. The first is how it's never obvious the risks that will get you. Second is how breathtakingly quickly things can go horribly wrong. And the third realization is how alive I feel in the wake of this episode. I am alive and more conscious of life's beauty than I have been in a long, long time. My skin buzzes from cold, my muscles still cramp from exertion, my brain finally lets go and I laugh. What a strange scene misadventure, swimming furiously on a seemingly impossible task and then arriving naked at the place where I started. This was as close to a reenactment of birth as I'd care to imagine. Back to the center. I'd like to believe that next time I'll be more careful, but that thought assumes that I have some measure of control over personal circumstances. I'm not sure that is the case. Rebirth on a river, a fine place to say thanks and try again. Wow. Excellent. I'm glad you read that. I I actually, I, I remember, that, that's an old book too. And I, I remember reading it. I was like, what the, oh my Lord. And what, how timely to be quite honest. 2001. Jeez. Because it's almost like what we're dealing with now. It's almost like, it's like, it's like trying to go after a drifting canoe, right? So oh my, I've got a tear. <laughs> All right, sir. A cheers to you. Oh, you got a fancier glass than I do. What's it with that? 
That is uh, my favorite uh, whiskey glass. It's uh, a tasting mug from the Bullmore Distillery in, um, in Isla. Hey, listen, you get your sailor's papers. You can do what I do for Adventure Canada, which is work from time to time on um, seaborne tours of, of Scotland. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. Where do I sign up? Yeah, well, you have to go and learn how to fight fires in, a cl in enclosed spaces like here or uh, in the bowels of ships and yeah, learn about terrorist training and a few of those other things. You got you to gotta line up with 25-year-olds and pretend you're tough, Kevin. I find this incredibly difficult, but it leads to an amazing place, which is work on ships in the Arctic and the Antarctic, which um, is a lovely counterpoint to uh, sitting at the typewriter till beads of blood come out of your forehead, which you know all <laughs> Oh my lord, your your life is so dull. All right. Well, cheers to you, sir. And uh, thanks for the chat. I'm gonna blow out the candle and say goodbye. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Love what you're doing. Love what you're doing. You're amazing. I don't like that whiskey though. <laughs> <laughs>